Okay. Are you ready? One, Brushing two, aside three. the problems with the precarious jetty, Goodburn decides that one last push should be enough to launch the boat and instructs the chainsaw operator to get in and row. OK, hold the gun off. Nice one. It might not have been the most elegant of launches, but the log boat now safely floats in the water. The team doesn't have time to waste. They still need to launch the other boat and lash the two together. But one of them is sinking. Undeterred, the team presses on with lashing the boats together, which involves drilling holes in the side of the boat. That's done. With the boat securely tied, the task of getting the stone onto the boat begins in earnest. OK, you ready, people? Yep. One, two, three! <laughs> Worried that the stone might slide too quickly, Goodburn changes tactics. Yeah, that's it. So try a gentle push on three, OK? One, two, three. Nothing at all. You can leave it, man. Um, well, I think if you put a lever behind that big cross piece... Hey. With the lever in place, the stone begins its slow crawl down to the boats. Next, the volunteers control the weight of the stone as it's placed on a bridge that will tilt it towards the boats. Get good grip with that pole. OK. OK, B3. As they take the strain, Goodburn's plan is to have them slowly release the sled. OK, let go on that side a little. Relax slightly. But then disaster strikes. Let the boat out, please. We need to pull this over now. Let, let this Goodburn is too distracted to notice what has happened. Okay. But the stone is still slipping, and he hasn't realised that the sled is now stuck underneath the poles on which it was supposed to be resting. Okay, we need to let the boats out now. We can't. By the time they notice what has happened, the tide has started to turn against them and a frantic rescue plan is devised. Now, what we really want, if there's any chance on earth that you can pull uphill there... Maybe... The idea is to winch the sled up, reposition it and then remove the bridge, all before the boat gets grounded. Take the On three. One, two, three! Yes, enough! Hold it! Lean back. You can't pull if you're vertical. The sled is now in the right place, but there is a much more pressing problem. The boats are dangerously close to sinking. They plug the leak with flax and lard, which should last at least a couple of hours. With the boat temporarily repaired, it's time to remove the bridge. Can you put it right out now, please? Gently, not too fast. OK, you can just pull it clear, OK. Now what do we do? Fortunately, someone comes up with a solution. And with one last use of the indispensable lever, the stone is levelled. Got some leaking through that peg. Can you tap that in a bit more if I give you this? But only gently, But with the leak still threatening to sink the boat, it's time to get afloat and run the experiment. Could the combined technology of log boats and human power move a four-ton stone across a tidal estuary? Or would the weight of the stone prove too much? Oh, yeah. 
We have proved beyond doubt that Britons in the period between the Late Stone Age and the Early Bronze Age could have moved blue stones from Wales to England to build Stonehenge. But this exercise was easy. It was made comparatively simple with the aid of modern tools to make just one boat to move just one stone a few hundred yards on calm waters. Our ancient cousins seemingly built boat after boat and moved stone after stone, hundreds of miles across open sea. The scale of investment of time, human effort and ingenuity is almost beyond comprehension, and this from a supposedly primitive people. Their job was not yet over. Once the stone arrived on the site, it still had to be raised. This is step two in Smale's guide to how to build Stonehenge. Back at the attempt 10 years ago, the team of engineers thought that this could be done most efficiently using a ramp to provide a pivot point. It seemed raising the large top stones or lintels was not beyond Bronze Age Britons either. All that was needed was a big wooden scaffold. Ancient Britons could have built Stonehenge. All they would have needed was a little engineering knowledge and some simple levers and ramps. Armed with all the data, can Smales calculate just how many man-hours of labour it would have taken to carry out all the work? We're looking at probably a peak workforce of maybe 300 people, taking on the short end, the quickest it could be built, maybe two and a half, three years, and using in the order of a million and a half to three million labour hours. The work may have been spread out over generations, much like a medieval cathedral, but what could have possibly motivated them to undertake such a huge project? What is the relationship between architecture and the corresponding societies that create it? Dr. Ronald Smith is an expert. He explains. As you look at these places, they're reflections of us, the reflections of a culture, the reflections of emotions that we express. They are, in fact, a study of us. Smith thinks that the way a building is built gives us information about the intentions of the people who built it. So analyzing Stonehenge's size, structure and shape will help us understand why it was constructed. Smith explains his theory with a modern example, Las Vegas. Why, for example, are all the buildings so big? Large in America is seen as good, is seen as beautiful. We are a country of large things, from buildings to cars. Everything large is good here. An interesting theory. But then when you start to look around, you realize that people do interact with buildings and structures in an emotional way. So going back a few millennia, was there some...